Hey there, Haskell Weekly listeners. Welcome to another episode of the Haskell Weekly podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack. I'm the Director of Software Engineering at ACI Learning. And with me today is Cam. Thanks for joining me today, Cam. Hey, Taylor. Nice to nice to be here. It's uh, always good to catch up. I know we've seen each other a couple times this week for lunch. So you know, <laughs> what what's another day? It's three days this week we've seen each other. Yeah, Whether that be unfortunately... Virtual. No Tex-Mex today, unless that's what you had for lunch, but... Nope. I went to a, a place in town that uh, just like kind of teriyaki bowls. Fantastic. Good good stuff. Nice. Uh, but Sounds yeah. good. Uh, Cam, I didn't give you an intro. You want to intro yourself? Uh, sure. My name's Cam. <laughs> just kidding. My name's Cameron <laughs> Guerra. Uh, I am a senior software engineer at uh, Caribou now. Our name was previously Moto Refi, and we just... Um, relaunched on Monday, a new brand. So, uh, yep, that's been really most of my week anyways, but yeah, it's been good. How's, uh, how's things in the IT pro world? It's going good. Uh, I actually am off today and I was off yesterday for veterans day. So it's been a short week for me and we got Thanksgiving come up, coming up in a couple of weeks and then Christmas. So getting into that holiday vibe. Um, but it's been good. As I mentioned last week, still working on that merger with practice labs, which is going well. And uh, in, in terms of tech stuff as a team, we are working on moving a lot of our models, our database models into persistent from the previous ORM that we were using. And that's going really well and we're looking forward to being done with that migration, but we've been hitting very interesting little tricky bits throughout the process. Nothing that's persistence fault, just like, oh, this thing does it that way and persistent does it this other way. And now we have to make those things agree with each other. Yep. I mean, that's really moving any major system over, right? I mean, yes, it's just a database layer, you know, an interaction library, but it does do things differently and it does a lot of things for you. So when you change those, it's 90% of the time not going to be one for one replacement. And you'll exactly. have to do some mix and matching to get it uh, to a nice good place. Yeah. And I was actually talking about this with the team and I remarked that earlier in my career, when I was working on a Ruby code base of similar size and age, it would have been unthinkable to change our core database, like the core library that talks to the database. There's no way you could confidently do that. And the fact that it is even a possible refactoring we can do in our Haskell code base, I think speaks to the overall maintainability of Haskell, which is in my opinion, one of its biggest strengths. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We're using Postgres simple right now because we don't really have a ton of database interactions at the moment with microservice architecture. We can kind of keep it isolated and keep it pretty small. Um, and when we do do queries, we're using, uh, the SQL quasi quoter from Postgres simple quasi quoter or whatever it's called. <laughs> um, I like so, it. Yeah. It's been working pretty well so far. Haven't had any production uh issues or anything like that so and we've i guess this is the fifth day of our being in production state uh, so yeah we've we've got yeah. like for our new product that we're doing which is the insurance product uh that i'm a part of we already have close to 300 leads just in this week and it's not been marketed or anything so it's uh pretty cool given some uh yeah, it's nice to see that everything works. You know, you can say, yes, I want to make this thing and I want to see that it works. But the fact that we hadn't, out of any of the teams, we had really no fires um, That's coming awesome. from our code. So, and it's worked well. We've already had some insurance requests transferred over to the insurance agency and all that stuff's been moved through. So, I mean, it's, it's nice to see the, the power of your, you know, programming language work and yeah your plans actually show up to do something that you want it to do agreed i was gonna ask what's up with you what's new at caribou but it sounds like you just told me so thanks <laughs> look at you Ryman. what's new <laughs> at caribou That's, uh, uh, and i feel like that also ties into what we were planning on talking about today which it was a bit of a slow news week in the Haskell world. So rather than doing what we normally do, which is kind of review a blog post from the past week, um, we're going to answer our first listener question, Woo! which came to us through Slack. 
So thank you very much to Drew on the Haskell Foundation Slack for sending me a question. And he asked, he would like to know how to structure real large applications. Do you use tagless final or MTL or reader T or free monads? So specifically, he seems to be asking about the, the monad, monad stack, stack. Mm -hmm. that is behind the scenes powering everything. So not like which, you know, web which. framework are you <laughs> using or, <laughs> or how are you deploying it or how do you test it? None of those things. So, um, I think Cam, you and I obviously have some shared experience at ACI learning working on this and you have some new experience at caribou. So, um, we have some answers to this and hopefully they'll be satisfactory, but you want to get us going here, Cam? What are you guys doing at caribou in this regard? Yeah. So, um, with our microservices, um, we have really kind of a core monad we use, our monad stack that's just really a wrapper around reader T with an environment. So um, for us, we don't necessarily, we just need to make sure we have an environment that we can access anywhere in you know the pro, each of our services. So uh, that way we can call out to third-party services or uh, call out to the database, those kind of things. So, uh, you know, we, we found that reader T is good enough for us. Um, Another little thing we have on top of that is, or another, some of the classes that we're deriving uh, for that would be like, we're actually using Unlift IO, so we don't have to like, we can actually run something in IO in the monad, uh, which has been kind of cool. And um, well, there's a couple other things. I mean, monad reader, uh, in the basics, obviously, applicative, monad, functor. Uh, I don't have the whole shebang in front of me, but Overall, okay. it's not overly complicated. It's, yeah, but it's a, it's a reader T. How about so you? So this reader T, well, I'll, I'll answer your, your question in a second, but I got some for you. Your reader T, is it wrapped around IO or is it wrapped around something else? Uh, you know, what's the base monad for the reader T? Yeah, we originally, I was kind of leaving that to up to the, we were, we we're allowing that to be uh, polymorphic, but more mm -hmm. recently we've been more, just IO because there's not really a lot that we're doing that has to be a different type. Um, or we don't have to be mm -hmm. in a different monad to um, execute that. So uh, yeah, IO is really the, the core monad underneath. Okay. And then when you write functions that need to, or that ultimately get executed in this environment, do you write them with concrete constraints that say this particular reader T with this environment in this base monad, or do you say something like has database access as a constraint on the whole thing? And then that's just a polymorphic M. Um, we've right now, since our services are so small and we're kind of trying to make sure we can like easily explain what's going on in our Haskell code to other others in the organization and who don't know Haskell yet, we are being pretty explicit in that. So, you know, most, monadic functions are, are app um it's that's our monad name which isn't it's fine it's weird for me because i know where you know I'm, I'm used to what we're doing aci where we do have something fun for our monad name you know <laughs> something different so uh it, it's not bad it's just uh different for me but it's um i totally lost my train of thought there but uh, what, what was your question again on that piece you were talking about um constraints versus concrete type signatures. Yeah. So we're concrete. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so you were asking me about what we do at ACI. Obviously you kind of know already, so this is more for the benefit of the listener, but, uh, for context, uh, we currently have essentially one monad stack. We have multiple executables that we end up delivering, but they all use the same monad stack. Now that didn't used to be the case. And it's really similar to what you're describing, where we have a new type wrapper that has a reader T inside of it. And then that's wrapped around um, usually IO, but sometimes it's wrapped around servant handler because we use mm -hmm. the same monad stack for both our servant handlers and for non web related stuff, stuff that runs like on our job queue or locally if we need to run a script or something like that. They all use the same monad with a different choice of an inner monad. Mm -hmm. And as a result, many of our uh, 
yeah, type signatures for functions are polymorphic over at least that inner um, monad choice. Usually it will say you can sub in whatever M you want here, but it has mm -hmm. to be monad IO or something like that. Right. And what we've been trying to do recently is move more toward a capability as a constraint, um, which is usually in the community called MTL style mm -hmm. after the library that implements all these things, where instead of saying you have to be this specific monad, uh, rather we're trying to say you can be any monad that has, let's say, access to Postgres, our database, or access to Recurly, our payment provider. Mm -hmm. And these are very coarse grained um, constraints. We're not saying, you know, read access to these things or write access or a particular model within the table or anything like that. Just can talk to the database is a big brush. Yeah. Well, do you, is that a type class for you guys or is that just a conglomerate of uh, other, you know, derived instances that are just kind of typed it to this one thing? It's actually a bit of both. So we have defined our own custom type classes to represent new constraints that we want to abstract over in the system. For instance, I mentioned Recurly, our payment processor. That's one where the capability to communicate with the Recurly API is behind this constraint that we create, a new type class. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I mentioned earlier, we're moving stuff over to persistent and persistent provides a lot of type classes for doing this stuff already. They have one for reading or performing database queries that are read only or read, write. So we're trying to use those when we can. Mm -hmm. And, um, our motivation for doing this change was that we're trying to also to write more tests and it can be convenient to have a function that is polymorphic over these things, not necessarily so that you can pick a different implementation. Like we try to use a real Postgres database in test, for example, but we don't want to talk to Recurly actually in our test suite because maybe you don't have an internet connection when you're running your tests, or maybe you just don't want to hit Recurly 30 times over and over again while you're running the test suite trying to fix something else. So having it be polymorphic lets you sub those things out. Or even if you are using the real thing, like with the Postgres database, having it be polymorphic makes it so that you don't have to um, set up the rest of the config to fulfill that environment that you may not care about. So it's just a little bit easier. Nice. Yeah, I uh, just this week, actually, I was pulling out, uh, we use MessageDB, which is kind of an event sourcing, um, I guess, setup for Postgres. So they have kind of their own sets of functions and things like that that you can use. And, um, and so we're using that and we have it in all of our applications. And so I was really getting to the point of like, these are, this, none of this is really that different. So I've actually pulled it out into a library that I'm hoping we open source here soon. Um, that is, you know, I'm, I've currently namespaced it behind like database Postgres message GB. So it's clear. Okay. You, it's gotta really be the Postgres implementation of message GB. Right. And then, um, I created a, for all the functions within that, um, instead of binding it to a specific monad, like, you know, uh, message GB or something like that, I opted to go with the type class route and say mm -hmm. like, yes, if it has this type class, then it can work. So now each of our app monads in, in our services can just derive their own instance for getting the configuration and getting the connection pool and those kind of things. Um, and that way they, nice. they're separated out. So I thought, I thought that was a pretty good win this week. Um, so that's, uh, it just sounds very familiar to what you were just speaking of. Yeah. I think there's a lot of commonality between these things. Um, but for you, if you were to give advice to somebody who, you know, drew asking this question, how should I structure an application? What would be your answer? I mean, I hate this, but it, it depends. <laughs> so I, I know that's not a good answer, but that's the honest answer here because to me, I think you, it depends on, first of all, how large your application is, what the purpose of your application is, and really the overarching, like, overarching like, direction your company's trying to go. So for us, we're going with a microservice architecture and we really care about just being consistent because you have a lot of microservices that are really not all that different, 
but you don't want to have you know five different styles of right code and so right now we're, we're creating you know concrete um the, our, our concrete monad selection and things like that so we're not abstracting any of that away because we're not really concerned like we do have some servant stuff but we're actually running that nio rather than in the servant handler and mm -hmm. so we don't have to really worry about handling two different monad you know two underlying monads we our command handle app did and that's what i kind of like which was our first service and i was using i was really using my knowledge base from what were you doing aci and but through some of the work we've done and kind of simplifying it we realized okay io is really the only thing we need to be in um <clears throat> so for me i would say keep it as simple as you can and um i mean i definitely did like the parameterized monad you know rather than saying it's always this one but uh with these small services it makes sense with large services i would definitely be on the boat of yeah parameterizing it and you know being dynamic or polymorphic in that way mm -hmm. how about you i i fully agree with that um i think it definitely depends but as a general rule my suggestion is going to be stick with reader t until you start to feel the pain of that and you may even be able to address some of the pain by using a library that gives you some niceties with this approach. So like the Rio library or RIO, I can never remember which way it's meant to be pronounced. That library um, codifies this reader T idea and provides you a lot of common helpers with it. So it can be really useful to use that rather than slowly building up all those things yourself. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm um, in agreement there, reader chi, until you can't. Um, and then also, like, deriving monad reader in that reader chi. So you can mm -hmm. just kind of call ask whenever. It's pretty, it's pretty nice. It's convenient, I would say. Yeah. Yes, make liberal use of the deriving mechanism to get all the hand, handy instances that you need. Um, I was going to mention that like I said, we have been moving a little bit toward using more MTL style constraints on our functions. And that's a natural extension of this application architecture where you have something concrete and you want to make it polymorphic. And this is the way that you do that. But the kind of other approach in the community is free monads. And I haven't talked much about those because I haven't used them in anger. I am aware of them and I know kind of what they do, but I haven't used them enough to really feel confident having an opinion about them, but it seems to me like taking an application that's written as a reader T um, app monad, that could be a challenge to pull that into the world of free monads. And maybe that's not true. Again, I don't really have experience doing this, but that's why I'm not talking much about this at least. So free monads could be good, could be bad. I really don't know. Yeah. I also am in that boat of not really, I mean, I've read some posts on free monads and got the general idea, but never have put it into practice in production so mm -hmm. i can't speak to it um but i do say you know if, if the monads want to be free let them be free <laughs> you know like that's all i gotta say about that one i know that yeah. was obviously terrible and not the answer to free monads so uh you can um, tell me that i'm wrong on the internet it's okay and then the the last note i have on this is that both you and i are coming at this from the viewpoint of generally speaking, a web application. And we have associated services that run like a job queue, or like I mentioned at the top of the show, some one-off scripts or something like that. But typically the apps you and I have built are web apps. So if you were not building a web app, this advice may not apply quite as much. Um, and really the only other thing that I have a big amount of experience building in Haskell is a command line application where it is something that takes in an input file and processes it and spits out an output file, which describes many, many things. Uh, it's a Rocket League replay parser, but the details aren't super important. And the way I've structured that application is not using this reader T concept. And instead what I do is the um, pure core imperative shell architecture that Gary Bernhardt talks about that isn't specific to Haskell. And what that means is I do all of the IO at the boundaries of my system. And I say, 
okay, I, you know, read my input file, read the config, figure out what I'm going to do, set everything up, and then hand it off to a pure thing that computes the answer or, you know, does the computation, the analysis, whatever it is, and then produces a pure value as its output. And then again, hand it, hand that back off to the IO world and say, okay, pretty print this or print it out to a file or do whatever it is you need to do. You know, I'm done with my part. And I really like structuring that thing, structuring things that way, because it lets me test things much easier so that I can assume the IO part is pretty small and it'll probably do what it's supposed to do. And I can test the pure part in the middle. And obviously there are many different types of applications. These are just the two that I've worked on most commonly. So that's what my advice is going to be biased toward. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I mean, I'm web application all the way at this point. So maybe, maybe one day I'll get into the realm of a CLI with Haskell or something along those lines. But uh, yeah, I'm learning all about tiny micro web services and Mm -hmm. aggregators and event sourcing and CQRS and all kinds of fun jazz. And it's been actually really cool to see and understand. So, yeah, there's a lot of great variety in web apps and lots of fun problems they can solve. I just wanted to acknowledge that there are other types of apps and our advice may not apply too much to them. So if you're working on, you know, a real time trading system or something like that, you know, maybe use Reader T, maybe it works or maybe do something completely different. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And if, anyone from this has more specific questions that they'd like us to dive in and research on, we're also happy to do that. So, Yeah. And this was our first reader question. So thank you so much, Drew, for sending this in over Slack. If you're listening to this show and you've got something you'd like to hear us talk about, please reach out. We can be found all the usual places, um, Slack, Twitter, Carrier Pigeon, whatever you want to do. <laughs> nice. And but, uh, uh, you know, go ahead. yeah, I was just going to, uh, thank thank all of our listeners and you know if uh, do you want to do the part about your company or should i do the part about your company i'll do the part about my company all right um well, should i tell them where to find us because you didn't tell them haskellweekly.news so if you want to check out this week's uh news that's out there go to haskellweekly.news and you can find latest podcasts as well as the latest newsletters and yeah, stay in the know with the Haskell world. Yo, over to you. There you go. Sign up for that newsletter. And this week, like every week, we are brought to you by my employer, ACI Learning, uh, specifically IT Pro TV, the learning platform for IT professionals. If you'd like to get 30% off the lifetime of your subscription, head over to itpro.tv and put in offer code Haskell Weekly 30 at checkout. That's Haskell Weekly 30 at itpro.tv. Nice. Uh, yeah, and another quick announcement before we break off here is that you have a couple more days. I guess by the time this is published, you won't have any more time to do the Haskell survey. So you may just want to cut this bit out. Maybe. If you're listening to this, when it's published, fill out the Haskell survey. It may be open for another few hours. And if it's after then, look for the results soon. Boom. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for listening. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.